All right, happy Easter. So glad that you're here today. So I know that uh, some of you have been around here a long time and others of you are, are just brand new. Really glad uh, for wherever it is that you are on the continuum. We're going to go in just a moment to John chapter 20. So why don't you be taking your Bibles and uh, you can turn to John chapter 20. And if you need a Bible, why don't you wave at one of the ushers? They're coming in the aisles right now, and they'll be glad to let you borrow one. And if you don't have a Bible, it's our gift to you. You just keep it and take it home with you. Happy Easter. John 20 is where we're going. And don't be afraid to use the table of contents if you need your way uh, to sort of find your way around. Meanwhile, I'll tell you about something that happened in our family. A couple of years ago, I had to go to the emergency room late in the middle of the night with one of my boys. And he was having some terrible pain, and uh, it didn't take very long for them to say he may have appendicitis, and we may have to do an appendectomy. Oh, okay. So they said, we're going to go ahead and just put the IV in, in case that is indeed what happens. So I said, okay. The lady comes in a few minutes later, and she proceeds to tell him, now, honey, you don't need to look. And of course, he looked. And she stuck it right in. And then, as you do when you get an IV, she bent it down and, and taped it down, everything. And then she walked out the room. No sooner had she left, he looks at me in horror and says, get this thing out of me. And I said, son, I can't take that out of you. He said, that lady came in here gave me the shot, left the shot in, and put the bandage on top of the shot. He thought they'd send her the most ADHD nurse in the whole hospital. It had never occurred to me, because I'd have so many, I've had so many IVs that he did not know what was going to be happening. To him, it was totally foreign. It was totally unexpected. It, it, just, it made no sense. It was all wrong. And I tell you that because I think in a very real way, that is exactly what the early followers of Jesus were feeling in that week of the first Easter. It was all falling apart. It made no sense. Now, the challenge is, those of us who've been around for a while, we, we kind of know what happens on Easter, right? We've been through this a few times. I think to really appreciate it, we have to try to put ourselves back into the mindset of the first timer, the person who's never gone through this. Go back and let's think like Peter, James, John were thinking, or some of the women who followed him like Mary, the mother of Jesus, or Mary Magdalene, and others. We have to put ourselves back in their mentality and, and try to imagine everything that had gone on in the recent 72 hours, okay? It was just all wrong. See, they had been following this Jesus for the better part of three years, and they really thought, we've found the Messiah. We have found the Savior. But the further along in his ministry had gone, the, the further along, the more livid, the more irate, the more hateful his enemies had grown. And it wasn't because Jesus was just going around the countryside teaching nice little stories and saying, here's how you could have a better life. No, you don't get killed for that. Not back then, not now. That's not what he was doing. Now, Jesus was coming along and he was making big, bold, audacious claims He'd said things like, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He was saying, no one goes to the Father except by me. Huge claims. He was claiming deity. And the thing about it is, he always had the chops to back it up. You could never out-argue him. He always had more wisdom and a better response. And he had miracle working power. He was able to heal people. He was able to walk on water. He was able to multiply the food, the loaves and the fishes just right there. And he was even able to resurrect several people who had died. And the more of this sort of thing that he did, the more his enemies were like, we can't stand this guy. 
He is stealing our thunder. And finally they concluded we've got to kill him. And so astoundingly, within just several days of him being paraded through Jerusalem with the palm branches waving and they were all declaring, we have found the Messiah, the savior of the world. Within several days, his enemies had managed to turn the tide of public opinion totally against Jesus. And by Thursday, he'd been arrested, falsely accused. By Friday, tried in a very unfair court and put to death in a brutal way the death of crucifixion, which if you've never studied it is is a morbid, terrible way to die because you die of suffocation, asphyxiation, because you can't breathe, your chest can't support yourself as you're hanging there on the cross. And so his followers, these first timers, their heads were spinning Nothing was going according to plan. It made no sense. It was all wrong. Their savior was dead. And so a few men kindly, graciously took him from the cross and buried him hurriedly, hurriedly because it was Friday and Friday evening when the sun sets, the Sabbath begins for the Jewish people. And you can't work on the Sabbath. So they were hastily getting him into the tomb. And uh, having to forego some of the more normal burial rites. But the plan was several women were going to go back on Sunday morning at sun up and complete the burial process and anoint the body and so. Um, <clears throat> and that's where things really got interesting because the women arrive at the tomb and to their shock, the stone has been rolled away. And you know they're thinking, perfect. Could this story get any worse. Someone has come and they've stolen his body now. To these first timers, everything was just very, very wrong. One of those ladies who I think doesn't get enough attention is the one that I want to spend the next few minutes telling you about. Her name was Mary Magdalene. They called her Mary Magdalene because she was from Magdala, which was a little town on the western shore of Galilee. Magdala would have been a nice, luxurious place, maybe a bit like Acapulco. Lots of luxury and lots of licentiousness was known to have happened in Magdala. Church tradition holds that Mary, this Mary, had once been a prostitute in Magdala, which would have certainly fit the narratives about that town. Of that part, we're not sure, but what we do know is from Luke chapter 8, that when Jesus first encountered Mary Magdalene, she was possessed by seven demons, but Jesus had cleansed her from all of that darkness, freed her from all of that brokenness, and so no longer was she someone that stood on the outside of every desirable category for by the power of his grace Jesus had healed her and restored her and renewed her and she had hitched her wagon to him and was following him wherever he went with all the others so it shouldn't come as a surprise that on that first Sunday after the crucifixion Mary found herself right by the tomb anchored there. All the others, the accounts say, were sort of running here and there trying to figure out where's the body, where are they taking him? But she just anchored in right there at the tomb. And that's where things get very interesting for her because something very powerful happens. Let's look at it in John chapter 20, starting in verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stopped to look at the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? 
supposing him to be the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, please tell me where you have laid him and and I will take him away. To this, Jesus said, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Now, this passage, I believe, offers three important things that I really want us to highlight. So if you're a note taker, here's the first one. At first, she missed him. She missed him at first, despite some pretty blatant clues. The stone has been rolled away, but his grave cloths are neatly folded. We know that from another passage. Grave robbers wouldn't have taken the time to fold the clothes up in a nice, neat way. She's missing the clues. She's talking to two angels. Hello, Mary. You're talking to angels right now. But like somebody just driving right through the stop signs, she's just missing every single clue. She even begins to talk to the resurrected Christ. And she's missing him even there. She's not recognizing him. She thinks he's the gardener. And says, look, if you've been the one who took him, you just, would you just tell me where he is and, and I'll take care of him from there. Why did she miss him? I think it's because she was looking for him in Friday's categories. She was still looking for her bloodied, bruised, broken Jesus who had been put into that tomb on Friday. The thought of a resurrected Lord just wasn't a category that her mind was open to at this point. And so she went with a convenient category that made sense to her mind, and that was gardener. And you know, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people miss the resurrected Christ in their lives and the power that he could bring into their lives because they're trying to press him into their preformed category as well. Like my friend Rick. He's a friend from the gym. We work out together sometimes. And we talk about spiritual things some. He is a proud agnostic, if not atheist. And, <clears throat> and he loves heavy metal music. Loves to play me the heavy metal music songs. Which has been a fascinating learning thing for me because it's just a whole new genre. And, and one that I've not been familiar with. And, and including satanic uh, bands. And, and so he's played me some of the satanic band's music, and, and I'm like, I can't understand the words. And he's like, I can't either. And I said, so are, are they worshiping Satan right now? And he's like, mm, turns the music off. He's like, Ken, everybody knows satanic bands don't really worship Satan. And I'm like, well, that feels hypocritical to me. I don't know. He's like, no, they're, they're atheists um, is, is typically what, what that means. But then one day Rick said, You want to know why I think God hates me? Yeah, I would. He said, I'll tell you why I think God hates me. He said, because see, when I was a kid, my grandfather was my very favorite person in the whole wide world, and he had cancer. And so I prayed, and I said, God, if you're real, and if you can hear me, would you please heal my grandfather? Because if you do, then I'll believe in you, and I'll do whatever you ask me to do for the rest of my life. And he said, Ken, I've, I've heard of a lot of people that prayed that sort of prayer and God seemed to come through for them. And he didn't come through for me. My grandfather died. And ever since, I've just concluded, well, he must hate me. And I don't believe in him either. I said, wow. I'm sorry that your grandfather died. And I can see why you would think that God hates you in light of what you just shared. I said, Rick, I don't think God hates you. I think he actually loves you. 
And I think he loves your grandfather as well. And I'll tell you why. Because I, in my line of work, Rick, I bury a lot of people. Roughly over time, 100% of them. <laughs> Sooner or later, everybody goes. And so, Rick, don't you see, if having a loved one not die was the proof that God loved anybody, then ultimately God would love nobody because sooner or later, death comes to everybody. It doesn't mean that he hates you, Rick. He loves you. But I do think you're never going to experience the power of his love in your life if you insist on using the grid that you just gave me as your only grid through which you would ever see him. You're going to be just going around in a cul-de-sac. See, if your unbelief is the grid through which you're seeing everything, then you're totally going to miss him. Because you're thinking in Friday's categories, just like Mary Magdalene was. He was standing right there, and she was missing him for the world category. She says to Jesus, so you're the gardener, huh? To this he says, Mary. And in that one word, scholar Tom Wright says, he rolled together a greeting, a consolation, a gentle rebuke. Don't you recognize me? Mary, and an invitation. Mary, finally, she recognizes him. Oh, she missed him at first, but the second thing is, she heard him. That's the second thing. She heard him. John 10, 3 and John 10, 27, that we say, 27 say that we, like sheep, will hear and recognize his voice if we'll listen. You know, just as Jesus called Mary Magdalene by name, he knows your name, and he wants you to hear him as well. So it was last Monday, Suzanne said, hey, we've got more than 30 people coming over for lunch on Easter, and our windows look terrible, and I need for you to handle that. So I took a deep breath prayed for help, and Googled window cleaners. And, <laughs> and I found one that had the nice pictures that is called Pristine. I said, no, Pristine, that's, that's what I want. I want Pristine. So I, I, I called up the Pristine window number, and uh, I got talking to the person, and he, and he said, when do you need help? And I said, oh, I need it now. Um, he said, oh, this is a terrible week. You know, it's coming towards Easter. It's a very busy week, and there's going to be a couple of rain days. And I said, oh, trust me, I feel your pain. Why don't you come on over anyhow, and, and we'll commiserate. Because <laughs> I'm under a little stress myself. And <clears throat> so he said, we'll work you in. So I'm so glad that he did, not just for the windows, which have never looked better, but because of the conversation that we would have. No sooner had his three assistants gotten out and they're starting out and they're doing the deal. And, and he says to me on the front porch, he, he said, having seen our, our little Easter sign, yard sign, in the, like many of you have had in your yards uh, leading up to today, he says, so do you go to Faith Bridge? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> do you? He said, no, but I know a lot of people who go there. I said, so do I. And <laughs> He said, I'm going to give you my believer's discount. And I said, fantastic, thank you. I said, so Raymond, how did you become a believer? He said, oh, that's a great story. He said, one night some years ago, I was, I was up at night just watching TV, just going through the channels, and I came upon an old Billy Graham revival service. 
And I didn't know who that was, and I didn't care what he was saying. The only reason that I stayed on the channel is because he was in Dodger Stadium. And see, when I was a boy growing up in California, my dad and I had tickets to the Dodgers, and we would sit in the outfield, and I was just wondering if maybe they would scan the camera to, to those seats that we would sit in. Because see, my dad isn't living any longer But whenever I have a chance to look at Dodger Stadium, if the camera scans just right, I can see those seats, and it just just makes me feel good. He said, that's the only reason I kept watching. I was just trying to find our seats where he and I used to sit together. But as he was going along, Billy Graham said something that caught my attention. He said, the problem that you have is sin, and that all of your sins add up to such a point that you will never be able to undo them by enough good works. The weight of your sin will always be more. And that means you'll have to pay the price for your sin. And that will be eternal separation from God. He said, that was interesting to me. He said, but then Billy Graham said, but it's for this reason that Christ came into the world that he might die for my sins, Raymond said, and that my sins could be transferred onto him. He said, and I was listening, and, and the more he talked, the more it made sense to me, and he was like, that's what I want. I want my sins transferred off of me onto the cross, and I want to be forgiven because I want to have life. I want to start anew. He said, so he gets to the end and it's time for the prayer. And I just bowed my head and I just started to pray right there. And and I invited Christ to come into my life that night. And when I said, amen, he said, I knew it was different. Something had happened. He said, I felt lighter, like a thousand pounds lighter off my shoulder. And I felt this joy and excitement and life. So much so that I I went bounding into the bedroom and I said, babe, you got to wake up. I got to tell you, I think I just got saved. And she was so excited. She started crying, he said. He said, that's how it all started for me. And every house we pull up to, I, I try and find a way to tell that story because I want what happened to me through Christ to get to happen in every person's life, that they might come to know him and life. Imagine it. He was just surfing the channels, looking for his seats in Dodger Stadium. And Jesus' call became audible to him in that moment. Mary Magdalene, she was looking for Jesus, the one who had been buried. And she finally heard him say, Mary. By the way, I'm just wondering, what about you? Have you heard him calling you? Some of you, I think you're hearing him right now. You're feeling the tug of his Holy Spirit, even now the presence of him in this room right now. And if so, in a few minutes, we're going to pray, and I want to give you a chance to say yes, like Raymond did that night, to say, yes, I want you to come into my life and resurrect me, Lord Jesus. But first, we've got to finish the story. She missed him, and then she heard him. The last thing, she embraced him. She turned, verse 16 says, and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And he said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. That verse, 17, has always confounded me. Because it seems like he's saying, back off a bit, Mary, you know, personal space. You know, like, like what, was he still tingling with electrical energy from the, the resurrection and she was going to get zapped or something? That can't be it. 
We know because Matthew 28, uh, 9 talks about others who saw the resurrected Christ and they embraced him by the feet and they worshiped him. And they didn't get zapped, nor did he tell them, let go. And then to Thomas, about a week later, whom we refer to as the doubter, doubting Thomas, he said, go ahead, Thomas, touch. I can tell it will help you to believe what you're seeing. Put your fingers right where the spear went in. And put your hand right where the nails went in. It's okay, touch. So it can't be that. Tim Keller helped me to understand better what was going on in this verse and several of the things that I've shared today. And I'll tell it to you right here. Mary was thinking, now that you're alive again, Jesus, it's going to be just like old times, right? You'll you'll always be nearby and teaching us how to live every day and we're just gonna feel this closeness as we go from village to village together, right? She was clinging to Jesus with the desire to always keep him right beside her physically forever. But he, knowing her thoughts, said, no, Mary, don't get confused here. Yes, I am alive, but I'm soon going to be ascending back to the Father. This is not my second coming. This, This is not my final return This is the beginning, actually, of my departure. But let not your heart be troubled, because when I go, after I have gone, I will send the Comforter, my Holy Spirit, who will be not beside you like I have been, but inside of you. So I can travel inside of you thereafter through the power of my Holy Spirit. And then he said, now, Mary, that I've conquered the worst enemy of death, I want you to go and I want you to tell my brothers all of this good news. And that's interesting, too, in verse 17, because it's the first time you see in Scripture that he ever called the disciples brothers. He'd called them followers, he'd called them disciples, but he hadn't called them brothers. What's going on here? Why why is he doing this now? Because he's making a, a huge declaration. He's saying, now that I've accomplished my mission... I've conquered even death. He was saying, you, all of you can come back into the family of the Father, which will make you my brothers and my sisters, not servants. He's saying, mission accomplished. Sometimes skeptics say to me, Ken, do you really believe all that stuff in the Bible. I do. And I think you would too if you really gave it some serious thought. (laughs) Numerous reasons, but I'll just tell you one. It has everything to do with the text we've just looked at. And it's this. If you know anything about the chauvinistic times 2,000 years ago, if you've studied any about history or literature in a world of 2,000 years ago, you would know that if someone were making this story up, they would have never written into the script that a woman was the first person to meet the resurrected Christ. See, we miss that today because we get our lead stories from women all the time on cable news, social media, uh, print press. That just feels normal to us. No, no, not back then. Back then, women, their word, their testimony wasn't even accepted in the courts of law. That's how low women were treated. And so don't you see, if somebody were making that story, they would never have said, and then she appeared to a woman. Because everybody would go, "Eh, that cannot be. There's only really one reason anybody would have ever written that down. And that is because it really happened that way. That in his ever-corrective way, Jesus saw fit to make his first resurrection appearance to a woman. So, I do believe it. Because he lives Mary Magdalene's life was forever transformed. Because he lives, my friend Raymond's life 
was transformed. Because he lives, my life has been changed. And countless others who have taken the name of Christ over the last 2,000 years, because he lives, your life could be changed as well, friends. You could step into new life through Christ today. You say, how? How does that happen? Simple. By admitting that you're a sinner. Because Romans 3 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But do you have the humility to say, I'm not perfect. I am a sinner. And then by realizing that what he did on the cross was not just to be appropriated into some other people's lives, but it could be appropriated into your life. It could count for you as well. You realize that. And then thirdly, you surrender yourself. You yield yourself, leaning the full weight of your faith in on him and saying, okay, I'm taking you at your word, Lord, and I'm gonna trust that it is true and that your forgiveness on the cross counts for my life by this exchange of trust. You surrender your life over to him. Friends, so many, many, many people over the years, even here at Faith Bridge, in the 20 years we've been here, have done that very thing. They've given their lives over to Jesus Christ, and they've let that decision be marked through baptism, which is the, the the, the thing that we practice, that Christians have practiced for 2,000 years, where, where under the water a person is laid like Christ was laid in the tomb and then brought out to celebrate a new life, that God is doing a new thing where old things happen, now new things have come. We've had so many people, wonderful baptism services, even this past year. In fact, why don't you just take a look right now and you can see some of them. Take a look. So my friend David Zips beside me. David uh, came to Christ when he was about 10 years old as a kid, but he has lived most of his life on his own terms. What I would say about Brittany is that she was headed toward a life of destruction and death. She found herself far from God. She described that period to me as agnostic, just really questioning everything that she knew to be true as a child. Her older brother had passed a few years ago and afterwards she felt doubt and confusion and felt unsure that God's goodness was true for her life. And at that time, Dan was convinced no loving God could, could possibly allow something like that to happen. So he continued his earthly pursuits for a while and pretty quickly bumped up against two things that he couldn't do anything about. The first was his inability to make life go the way he wanted it to go. And the second was this inner selfishness that he could not rid himself of. And those two things worked together to convince him that maybe God had a better idea. She said, even when I turned away from God, he never left. And it wasn't like he was just waiting on me to come back. He was pursuing me. He loved me enough that he came after me and he chased me and he recklessly loved me and he brought me back to him. It was during a time of prayer uh, between her and God that he made himself very real to her and changed uh, pretty much immediately. And through knowing Christ, um, and this revelation through His Word. Um, he has revealed to her how He wants her worries and her burdens and her fears, and how He's always welcoming her at the foot of the cross to surrender those all to Him. Something that has stood, that just stood out to me time and time again, is how God is taking the things that she has walked through and turning them into something beautiful. He's taken every single thing that she has experienced in her life, and that has made her into who she is today. Hallelujah. And ever since that day, her story has been rewritten with joy and peace and gratitude. To Rex, God is the one that makes sense of everything. Knowing Jesus is Hayes' favorite thing about being a Christian. 
He pursues you and cares about you no matter what you've done or who you are. His plan is better than anything we could dream up on our own. She is totally surrendered at this point in her life, and she wants to make a public profession of her faith in Jesus. He wants to step into the water today because he believes it's truly the next step of his faith. And this is just the outward profession that her heart is fully surrendered and given over to her Lord. So because he lives, Barbara is redeemed and she is living in the fullness of God's love. Because he lives, Jesse never has to walk in darkness again and gets to walk in the light of life for all of eternity. Because he lives, Joanna is no longer bound in worry and she is now free to experience the fullness of his joy. And because he lives, Dinah can face tomorrow. Dinah, you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Yes, then I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. That's what I want for you. I want you to do this. Um, pull out this card, all of you, everyone. If you didn't get one because maybe you just walked by uh, coming in, why don't you just uh, wave at an usher right now? They're coming right now in both rooms, and they'll be glad to, to give you one of those because you're going to need it because I want everybody to take part in this next moment, okay? You can fill out some of your information. We're not going to badger you, I promise that. But I tell you what we are going to do. You're going to see in the, in the top box, it talks about accepting Christ today. In just a moment, we're going to pray. And I'm going to guide you and give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Today's going to be your Easter. It's going to be your day. And uh, I want you to then check that box that you accepted Christ today. And then others of you, you say, well, I've, I've done that before, but I, I never did the baptism thing, and I think I would like to sign up to be in the next baptism. Why don't you do that? You check that box. Now, there's a third box, because any number of you are looking at me right now, and you're saying, honestly, I came today because my whoever brought me, and maybe I'm a little bit more like your friend Rick. Um, I just don't think I'm ready to say yes. Well, let me just ask you something. It's okay. You, maybe you're not ready to say yes today, but must you say no? What if you were to say something in the middle and say, you know what? I would at least be open to him showing me a new category because maybe you've been trying to, to press him into Friday's categories in your own life. And so my question to you, if you fall into this third category, is would you at least be open for a month? I say a month because I've just done this experiment with people over the years, and it never ceases to amaze me how the Lord shows up. You say, well, what do I do for a month? I'll tell you right now. I want you to, to, to pray. To, to, to pray not cynically, not skeptically say, sort of say, I'm going to take all that cynicism and I'm just going to put it on the shelf for a month. And for a month, I'm just going to talk to him as if he's real and if he's, as if he's good and loves me and that he's hearing me. I'm going to try it. You do that. And come back and, and be a part of the fellowship this coming uh, four Sundays. We're starting a great new series next week, The Things That Keep Me Up at Night, which is very relevant as we continue on in a passage called the Sermon on the Mount. And, and so why don't you come for the things that keep me up at night and say, you know, okay, I'll come back a few times. And, 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 and why don't you just be open to maybe the little serendipitous surprising ways that he would break through. And if at the end of the month you got nothing, well, okay. I don't think you'll get nothing. I've just seen this happen so many times. That's the third box. I, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment, and I want you to be willing to say, okay, I'm not saying yes, but I'm not saying no. I'm open to there being more 
than I've said that there is. Incidentally, I want you to put your, your name on the card and give us the information, not because we're going to badger you, not because we're going to spam you. I promise we won't do that. But particularly because we want to pray for you. I want to pray for you by name. And that leads to the fourth box, because there's any number of you in both rooms here today. You're like, there's not really a box for me. I'm not number three, and I've done number one and two. You can pray. I'm going to ask you to do that. You've been praying for the last 40 days of Lent, the the Lent calendar that we had, the prayer calendar. I'm going to ask you to just keep doing that for the next month and pray for the people. And we've already had a great response the first several services that we've had. I want you to say, okay, I'll commit to praying for those people um, for the next month that God would just show up and make himself real and that they would come to know the power of the risen Christ in their lives. I want you to know his power because it's real and it's available for you because he lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come and to give you our worship this Easter. Thank you, God, for each person who has come. Regardless of where they are in their journey, I pray, God, that you would uh, do a new thing. I pray in that first category for the person, people who are saying, today's my day, I I wanna trust in Jesus. And if that's you, you can just borrow these words as I say them aloud, there's nothing magical about the words, but at least it just reflects the heart. You might say, today, Lord, is the day I'm stepping over the line. I want to become a disciple. I want to learn what it means to follow you. I'm asking you to come into my heart, acknowledging that I am sinful. I'm not perfect. I do need forgiveness, and I want to change. And I'm asking you to come in by the power of your Holy Spirit and give me that forgiveness and cleanse me from all unrighteousness and repurpose me and give me a a clearer sense of purpose in my life. Today's my day. I pray, God, for those here who maybe they've already done that first box, but they never got baptized. And maybe today's the day they're saying, I want to do that. I want to mark what God has been doing in my life. Give them the courage to check that box, Lord. And then I pray particularly for the third category, the people who are here and they say, okay, I didn't come really open, but I'm not leaving really closed. I'm open. I pray, God, that you would show up. I've seen you do it so many times when people take a challenge like this. Would you break through to them? Show them them in ways they were never expecting, God, as, as they go to school or as they go to work, as they're interacting in their community, even as they're driving along, that you would just have these breakthrough moments and that they would say, well, this is really weird. I am kind of feeling like something is happening and it will be that their soul is springing to life. God, that's what I'm praying that you would do all across this place in the coming month. I thank you, God, for all of our praying saints and pray blessings on all of them as well. I thank you, God, for this day and for the chance to worship together and to talk about your word and for the assurance that you are still doing great things because you live. We pray it all in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, I'm so glad that you are here. You can give your card to the ushers at the doors and you're dismissed. Go in peace. Happy Easter.